let me kindly take uh, this time in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is Faith and Cut Church. Our vision is reaching the unreached through and cut lives in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, we are in a season of commemoration and celebration as the Bible tells us that uh, our master, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I am, the Prince of Peace, he was lifted up during this season as the Bible declares, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. As the Bible, it tells us that as Moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Hallelujah. That is our master as they gazed at the bronze serpent. Why is uh, the, the venom of the serpent was infiltrating and invading their nervous system, shutting down their hearts, their lungs, and their brains. The Bible declares anyone who looks at the bronze serpent will be made whole. Hallelujah. Child of the living God, that bronze serpent, it was uh, the shadow of our master, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hallelujah. That the author in the book of Hebrews, whose mission it was to show the preeminence, the supremacy of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 1, he declares, fixing our eyes unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Before you give in, before you give up, before you throw the tower, before you neglect this great salvation and go back to the ports of Egypt and go back to the pleasures and the sin of this world, consider him who suffered such hostility against sinners. He did not just suffer hostility against sinners. His blood was shed for the remission of sins. Not just sins, our sins. Hallelujah. Cast is a man who hangs on a tree. Christ Jesus, he was hung on a tree. Why am I so excited? Why am I speaking about Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain for our redemption? This is the season to commemorate. This is the season to celebrate, hallelujah, our deliverance from the canines of death, from the canines of sin, from the canines of hopelessness and depression and death eternally. Christ, he paid the price and the price, it was high. For our redemption and a good evening and can we today based on what i've just said to you can we give the lamb of god the fruit of our lips and we praise him we exalt him we glorify him we honor him hallelujah for he is the rock of ages that gave them water in the wilderness when they were thirsty he kept them hydrated Hallelujah. He kept them, I mean, vitalized rather. And we know that it is Christ who nourishes us. It is Christ who ensures that we remain saturated and hydrated through his presence. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you. We give you the glory, we give you the praise. As Lord, we are about to go through your word. Let this word edify us. Let this word build us up. Let this word speak with us, O oh Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, but we want to thank you once more, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy. 
Lord, we want to thank you for you lifted us up, oh God, from the deep. Because you are mighty clay, Lord God Almighty. We bless you and we thank you and we appreciate you for the gift of life eternal. And we thank you for the companionship. For you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We bless you and we give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. We pray, amen and amen. I'm just going to share some few thoughts, you know, with you. Then I will be out of the way. And it is important for us that we come together and we feast on this word. The incorruptible seed, hallelujah, of our God, the word that endureth forever, age to age, he stands. Hallelujah. Empires, they rise and they fall, but he stands. Age to age, he stands. During the age of Nimrod, who built the tower of Babel that was frustrated by the Trinity, because God said, let us go down and confuse their tongue and their language. And that was an era, that was an empire, that was a kingdom. And that kingdom, it vanished, but he remained standing the rock of the ages. We know that the Egyptian power and splendor and authority, it arrived and it vanished. We know that the, 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 the Babylonian empire, its splendor, its glory, its power, its pride, yes, it did arrive, and what happened, it vanished. We know that the Persians, they came to the picture, they rose up, they overthrew the Babylonian kingdom. According to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 44 and chapter 45. The last verses in chapter 44 and the first verses in chapter 45 in the book of Isaiah. And Cyrus ushered a new dawn, a new era, a new empire, the Persian Empire. We know that the Alexander the Great, he was raised, he appeared in the scene, he uprooted the Persian Empire. Hallelujah. And the, the, the empire of the Greeks, you know, it was overthrown by the Roman Empire. But we are still standing with the rock of ages. That's why the psalmist says, age to age, he stands. Hallelujah. That is our God. That is the King of Kings. Please join us this coming Sunday. You know the Sunday of the, the, the Palm Sunday. You know the triumphal entry of our Master. Where in Jerusalem that is significant to the church for us to understand why Jesus had to ride on a cart. Hallelujah. The King of Kings, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, riding on a cart. Entering Jerusalem. Why that is so significant and why that had to happen. It had to happen and that is exactly what I will be extracting from and I will be explaining, you know, from the scripture, the prophecy in the book of Zachariah chapter 9 verse 9 that it had to be fulfilled and indeed he was the Messiah. But nevertheless, and we'll talk about that one on Sunday. Now, without wasting any time, there's a series that I've been preaching and teaching from. And I want to speak with you this evening. And there's some few principles that we have to, you know, when we look into this generation of Zeru, Babel, and Joshua. You know, the priests who were chosen by God to lead the remnant that was willing Remember, they were not forced out of Persia. And it was clear that those whose hearts were moved, those whose hearts were willing, those who offered themselves voluntarily, you know, child of the living God, God will never impose his will 
in us. Even though the Bible declares it is God who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. But he's not going to force us to will and to do. We ought to be able to surrender, to conform to the will of our Heavenly Father by answering the call of Paul the Apostle. Who said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Now we see these men, they willingly offered their lives into the service of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And now we spoke about last this last Sunday. We spoke about the children of Judah led by Zerubbabel. They were building, restoring the temple in Jerusalem and with passion, not just passion, unquenchable passion, passion that is defiant, passion that stops to nothing. No obstacle, no hindrance, no opposition, you know, extinguishes this passion. But there is something that happened because remember that it was not their passion here. It was their hearts, the enemies, the Samaritans, the men from trans-Euphrates. They arrived to intimidate them. They arrived with the roars of fear of the unknown, with the roars of manipulation, with the roars, you know, of limitation and failure and impossibility. Yes, Rehum, the commander, and Shishai, the scribe, they arrived, the Bible, it tells us clear, to discourage them because they knew that it's only courage that thrives in the face of danger. It is courage that thrives in the presence of of fear because courage it does not thrive in the absence of fear even though i i am i'm afraid but i am not giving in i am not giving up i am not going to succumb to the manipulation and the lies of the devil you remember the chapter we read in chapter three in the book of ezra the bible tells us that the fear of the people in those countries trans euphrates in those countries had come upon them. It means eventually they, they anticipated that eventually here there will be opposition. They anticipated that here there's going to be sabotage. But in chapter 3, the Bible tells even though that fear had come upon them, they still had the tenacity. They still had the courage to rise up and rebuild the broken altar. Which altar? The brazen altar. The altar of burnt offerings. Hallelujah. And they rebuilt it. It means they had courage in the face of danger. In the presence of fear. They were able to thrive. They were able to place their hands on the plow. They did not wait for fear to vanish. They did not wait for limitation and impossibility and manipulation and intimidation to vanish but they rose up and they rebelled the brazen altar so it's something that is very important because the bible it tells us that these men from trans euphrates they arrived to discourage them so that through discouragement their courage is disarmed and the door is opened and then fear can infiltrate and invade their vision invade their unquenchable passion invade their faith because remember the just shall live by faith we don't walk by sight but we walk by faith when it says we don't walk by sight it means faith lives thrives outside the world of emotions faith is not governed by our five senses what we see what we hear what we taste what we touch what we smell that's why god said to joshua see 
I have given you the city of Jericho prior to the taking over of the city. So in other words, the Lord was simply saying, Joshua, this it is going to take faith. We will have to see the way I see because your physical eye is showing you that the walls are fortified, the gates are closed, and it means your physical eye is telling you that it's impossible to go through this gigantic gate and walls. But God was simply saying, Joshua, see, it was not Joshua, he was not blind. The Lord was not saying, that, see, because he, know, he knew that Joshua could see. But the Lord was simply saying, see, the way I see, see beyond the wall, the gigantic walls and the gate, because faith sees the positive end results of a thing. So in other words, Joshua see the walls already broken, the gate already broken, see victory. Hallelujah. Once in the physical there's limitation and impossibility, but see victory, see possibility. So it's so important, child of the living God, because that fear, the Bible declares they bribed counselors to advise them. They bribed the people that would frustrate their purpose. Now, that is something that is important to frustrate their purpose. So it was not about the Zerubbabel, about Joshua, about the father's houses, I mean, the, 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 the kingdom builders that were in Jerusalem. The enemy wanted to abort the purpose, wanted to abort their destiny, wanted to abort their vision, wanted to disarm and contaminate their faith because the enemy knew that faith and fear they don't call exist. Where fear rules, faith is not there. Hallelujah. Because if you allow fear to invade and fear to take control and to take over, then faith gets to be substituted. And the role of fear it is to paralyze our God-given abilities. And the main objective of fear, it is to put us in a spider's web. Hallelujah. And where there will be no progress, where there will be apathy, where there will be lukewarmness, where, you know, there will be not just lukewarmness, there will be complacency, and there will be spiritual blindness in that spider's web. And that is exactly what happened here. These men, they wrote a letter, I mean, to the king of Persia, and they told the king of Persia that if you allow these men to rebuild, they are going to rebel against you. But because of time, please revisit our message that I preached on Sunday on courage, and it's going to give you the background. But now, the Bible tells us in verse 24, chapter 4, verse 24, the book of Ezra. Then the work of God ceased. The work of God stopped. In other words, they then, you know, neglected the purpose. They neglected the vision. They neglected their destiny. Why? They were intimidated. Why? They were dis. Encouraged. Never ever underestimate the spirit of discouragement. It is a vicious spirit. It is a cruel spirit. It is the spirit of Jezebel that hunts for the true prophets of God. That hunts and, 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 and seeks to navigate and to search you know, for the true prophets of of God to eliminate them and that is something that is very very important what made Elijah to say my father take me take me because of a voice of a woman and that made listen here this is not about the gender when we speak about Jezebel it's not about the gender but when we look at the context she was a woman that spoke with Elijah but we understand Understand that Jezebel is a spirit that can be in a man or a woman. It is a spirit that is vicious. 
Hallelujah. And Elijah, he cried and said, take my life. He was discouraged. Courage was disarmed. And courage, twins, discouragement rather, twins with depression and loneliness because it wants to isolate you. And it wants to isolate you from what? From the people that matter in your life and we see what exactly happened now when we come here the bible declares in verse 24 they sat down they sat down other scholars you know when you study about this they speak about 15 to 16 years and then they speak about 12 years they sat down you know sat down and not rebuilding the temple for more than a decade you more than 10 years people discouraged not rebuilding they are not better than us we are human as god's people they were human as god's people and that is the plan of the enemy he brings storms he brings destructive storms he brings obstacles he brings a well wind you know the main purpose of that it is to discourage so that we neglect the call we neglect the vision we neglect the destiny that God has for us. And they sat down, not rebuilding. But now I want to share something with you. Then the Bible declares, then the prophet Haggai, prophet Haggai and uh, Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Jerusalem or in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel. Who was over them? Wow. The God of Israel. Who was over them? The God who does not sleep nor slumber. Who was watching over them? Wow. The Bible says they were discouraged. Unknowingly that there's a favor of God upon them. And knowingly that there's a presence of God, God himself, he was over them, watching over them like the spirit of God that was hovering, hovering, it's not being stationary, moving upon the waters of the deep. And the Bible says in verse 2, so Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them. So in other words, in chapter 5 now, we hear another story. We begin to hear now another story that they rebuilt. What happened here? They rebuilt the temple of the Lord, their God. They rebuilt the temple of their Lord, their God. Why? Because God was over them. Hallelujah. God raised, I want you to listen very carefully. God raised Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo. He raised them. Now, today I want to speak about Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, he comes from the tribe of Levi. He comes from the priesthood. Zechariah, he not just coming from the Levitical tribe, and it means this is a man who had a double portion. He was a priest, he had a priestly anointing, and God raised him up as a prophet as well. He was also prophetic. Hallelujah. And the Lord God Almighty, he raised him and for such a time, you know, for that generation so that he can speak up to that generation. And Haggai and Zachariah, they are called the prophets of restoration. Why they are called the prophets of restoration? It is because courage was disarmed 
from the Rupa Bell and Joshua and Kingdom Builders. They are called the prophets of restoration. People had gone back to apathy, had gone back to sin and immorality. People had gone back in prioritizing their own will and ambitions because of discouragement. They had neglected the vision of God. They had neglected the call of God. They had neglected the destiny of God. How do I know that? When you go to Haggai chapter 1, the Bible tells us in Haggai, give careful thoughts to your ways. You say it's not the right time to rebuild the temple once you are busy building your ambition, once you are busy building your empire, once you are busy building your names. Hallelujah. So in other words, it was no longer now discouragement that had happened. They had gone back to their old ways because you would remember these men, they were just coming out of Persia. The Persian lifestyle, the Babylonian lifestyle and thinking and system, it was still within them. That's why the Lord had to send Ezra the scribe, the priest, to teach God's people the law because there is no revival without the weight. Hallelujah. There is no revival without the weight. There is no fruitfulness without the weight. And that is exactly what God did when he was reviving his people, restoring them back to true worship. So I'm just trying to reveal something to you that there was faith in Jerusalem, but God raised Haggai. When he raised he raised Haggai, he raised him with Zachariah. Before the Lord brings a revival into a nation, he raises up true prophets. <laughs> Before the Lord raises, restores, or revives a nation, he restores a prophetic office. That's what he does. That's what the Lord God Almighty does. He makes it a point that the prophetic officer, it is restored. Before the Lord restored the children of Israel, he ensured that the sons of Eli, they were busy committing fornication in the temple, defiling the priesthood. And the word of the Lord, there was famine of God's word and visions. And God raised up Samuel when he raised up Samuel as a prophetic voice. And that is when the Lord was able to bring a revival way in Jerusalem. Why the Lord first, he must restore the prophetic office. You remember during the time of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, he had to appear in the scene because the Lord was busy dealing with the nation of Israel that was led by Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah appeared to the scene, the Tishbite, and he declared a, a, a famine that took, I mean, three and a half years. Why? Because the Lord, he first restores a prophetic office, voice, and a priestly office, because the Lord is concerned first about leadership. Before there's a revival in the nation, the Lord, he first restores the prophetic office office and we know that it was the Elijah who massacred 450 prophets of Baal. Now you must mark that 400 prophets of Baal but why 400 prophets of Baal and we hear about one prophet of the Lord even Obadiah told Elijah and said my master listen I have hidden the prophets of the Lord I've hidden them I've been feeding them with water and with bread you remember what the Lord said to Elijah he said no you are not the only one why because there's a remnant that has not kissed Baal there's a remnant that has not bowed down to Baal what am I trying to say to you child of the living God it is because sorry, it, 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 it is this in the absence of true prophets then false prophets they flourish where there is no legitimate voice the illegitimate voice, voices they take that opportunity they become opportunistic and what, do, what, what they, 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 they occupy the space. Why illegitimate voices occupy the space? It is because there is no legitimate voice. 
Hallelujah. In that space, what am I trying to say? Elijah, when God raised him up, Jezebel had eliminated and killed the prophets of God. Why she was killing the true prophets of God? It is because she wanted that the false prophets, they must arise. Not only arise, they must flourish. Because the enemy knows that when false prophets arise, God's people are led astray. Write it down. God's people, they are led astray. Way. The enemy knows that when false prophets rise, there is moral irresponsibility. Moral irresponsibility. You begin to see that the nation it is compromised morally. There is immorality. There is impurity. There is wickedness in every sphere and the area. You even find that filth within the church. Hallelujah. Why? Because the enemy knows that when false prophets rise up, it's not just a morally, I mean, irresponsibility, but there is also spiritual recklessness. People are careless. People are complacent. And there is a flourishing of false religion that takes place within that nation. It becomes victim to opportunists that come and do what and come with their gods and come with their immorality and wickedness and the people are introduced and led, introduced to false gods and led away from the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. And why the prophetic office is under attack? It is because the enemy knows it is that apostolic, prophetic anointing that brings revival in a nation. It is those offices, hallelujah, that makes the nation to exalt again righteousness. Why? Because they are the voice of reason. They are the voice of integrity. They are the voice of faith. They are the voice and the mouthpiece of our God. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Are you still with me? And uh, I'm not going to be long as I promised you. I'm not going to be long. I promised you and uh, we are and that's going to finish up and the Bible it tells us that the Lord made it a point that he raises up he raises up Haggai and raises up Zechariah hallelujah pure young men who were sensitive to the frequency of the Holy Spirit to speak into their lives. Now they begin to speak, you know, and Zachariah in chapter 4, when he speaks in chapter 4, verse 6, he says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord God Almighty. Now, I want you to understand something. Can we quickly, 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 quickly. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, verse 3 and 4. We are going to read from verse 3 and 4. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He who prophesies edifies the church. He who prophesies if you pray in a tongue you pray in tongues. It is for self-edification. And that's why I don't bother myself. 
Every, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't give. If I want to pray with tongues now, I'll pray with tongues. But I prefer to pray with a language, you know, that people will be able to hear and people will be able to identify. But in my private space, I pray in tongues for self-edification, for self-nourishment. Yes, I can pray with tongues now. I am not bound. I am not prohibited to do so. But I want to tell you tongues, they are for self-edification. So that when I pray before God's people, praying the way that God's people are edified, God's people are are inspired God's eye the eyes of God's people they are pointed up to our God because tongues they are for edification not for show off that I can pray in tongues but they are for self edification and after that self edification you know when you are built up promoted matured you know because edification means build up promote mature you know that is edification now after that you go out with a prophetic word. Hallelujah. Especially operating in that prophetic gift, the Bible says here, prophecy, pro, 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 before, before, prophecy, hallelujah, foretelling, foretelling, predicting the future. That prophecy, it's for edifying the church. It's for building the church. Wow. <laughs> Prophecy. It's for building. And that's why when we go to Zechariah chapter, sorry, Ezra chapter 5, the Bible declares when Ezra, Zechariah speaks to Zerubbabel, he says it's not by mind nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. And in chapter 5 in the book of Ezra, the Bible declares Zechariah and Haggai, they built alongside with Zerubbabel and Joshua and other kingdom builders because prophecy, hallelujah, it's for building the kingdom. It's for equipping the church. It's for edifying the church. It's for promoting and maturing the church. Hallelujah. It is there for exhortation. To exhort it to encourage. To exhort it to comfort. To exhort it to counsel. That's why Deborah the prophetess will counsel and advise the king. Hallelujah. It is something that is very important important to understand, to exhort, it is to rebuke, it is to correct, it is to restore, it is to warn, and that is the heart of God. That is what Zechariah did here. Sometimes we zoom in, in chapter 4, it's not by might, nor by power. Zechariah, through the series of visions that the Lord revealed to him, he also dealt with their apathy. He dealt with their complacency. He dealt with their spiritual lukewarmness. He dealt with their backsliding. And now he comes and says, it's not by might, nor by power. By, but, but by the Spirit of God, saith the Lord God Almighty. In other words, Zerubbabel, this worker, it's not going to take military power. It's not going to take the chariots of war, the horse of war, the spear, the sword, and the bow. This work, it's not going to take power. It's not going to take human strength, human wisdom. This work, it's not going to take your muscles. But this work, it is going to be accomplished through the Spirit of God. He's the one that is going to infuse endurance in you, the Spirit of God. He's the one that is going to infuse force attitude, mental strength, hallelujah. You will feel the pain, but you will continue soldiering on. You will continue running with the vision, walking with the vision. You will continue rebuilding the temple of the Lord God Almighty. Why? Because we have not received the spirit of fear, but of love and soundness of mind and boldness boldness to be lion-hearted to be fearless to be brave-hearted hallelujah the lord has given us the spirit of boldness of defiant and say i am not succumbing
coming. I am not bowing down. I am not giving in. I am not giving up. I am going to rebel. Hallelujah. I am not going to bury my anointing. I am not going to bury my vision. I am not going to bury my destiny. I am not going to bury. Hallelujah. The apostolic grace that God has placed in my life. Why? Because God has called us for such a time as this. And it is by the Spirit of God, saith the Lord God Almighty. And he goes on to say, who are you, O great mountain? So in other words, who are you, O Rehum, the commander? Who are you, Shinshai, the scribe, the secretary of trans Euphrates? Who are you, you limitation? Who are you, you impossibility? Who are you, you mountain of, I mean, witchcraft? Who are you? You are who? Who are you? You, you shall become a plain mountain. As metaphor to destructive storms, mountain as metaphor to obstacles and hindrances, we come across as we pursue our God desired destiny. And God was simply saying, You shall become as a plain. And the Bible declares, Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. For mountains, they melt like wax in fire in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. And with shouts of grace and grace to it, you shall complete the root of bear. You shall put the last stone upon this temple. Your hands have started this work and your hands shall finish this work. Hallelujah. You shall not die without fulfilling your assignment. You are not going to procrastinate this assignment. You are not going to bury this assignment. I have anointed you. I have given you the grace for this assignment. And therefore, soldier on. Continue to build. Continue to run with the vision. Continue to walk with the vision. Zerubbabel. Why? Because it's going to take grace. Be strong in the grace. Be strong in the grace that Christ has given you, Timothy. And your hardship as a good soldier. Why? Because this apostolic call, this apostolic pattern, it, it goes with the apostolic grace, young man, that you must stand upon. That Christ, the chief cornerstone, that Christ, the, the, the stone that was rejected by the builders that has become the chief cornerstone, has given us. That Christ, the foundation, hallelujah, has given us. And when Paul speaks, he says, as a wise master builder, hallelujah, I have laid the foundation because he had the apostolic anointing to lay foundation, hallelujah. And the foundation, it was not unscriptural. And when he speaks, he says that, that foundation, it is Christ himself. He has already been laid. So what am I trying to say, child of the, of the living God? I'm talking about the grace to finish, the grace to build, the grace to run with the vision. That's what God was saying to Zerubbabel through Zechariah with shouts of grace and grace to it. So in other words, you are not going to say, my power, my power has completed this way. My strength, my strength, my wisdom, my wisdom, my money, my money, my material things, my material things, my connections, my connections, but it will be obvious that with shouts of grace and grace to it indeed it is by God's grace we have completed this temple it is by God's grace we managed to fulfill and to execute this assignment and that's what the Lord was simply saying to Zerubbabel and it is something that is very very important Child of the living God, can we go to the book of Revelations, chapter 19? The book of Revelations, chapter 19. And we just look at something there that is very important, and then after that, uh, I will be out of your way. Now, the Bible, it says here, and I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see, that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me read it again. That uh, uh, John the apostle was tempted to bow down and worship the angel. 
Well, I thought maybe he, maybe he thought hey, this is the Lord. No, no, no. The angel said, no, 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 no. Don't bow down. Don't worship me. And that's why we must not worship angels. We must not bow down to men, to angels. And that's why we must not even worship human messengers because angel means messenger. We must never worship the message and the man. We must worship God and appreciate and honor, hallelujah, and love the messenger, but not worship the messenger and the message. Embrace the message, love the message, hallelujah, but worship the Lord God Almighty. Lest you find yourself loving messages, but not loving God, worshipping messages, but not worshipping God, worshipping messengers, but not worshipping God. And that's what the angel was simply saying here. No, 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 no. Don't worship me. Don't serve me. I'm a fellow servant with you, both of us. We are worshippers of our master. Now he goes on to say, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Of prophecy. It means a prophecy must be Christ-centered. <laughs> because prophecy is Jesus Christ. Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy. Now, what am I trying to say? What are you trying to say in this? It means that the prophecy, it must be Christ-centered. Why it must be Christ-centered? It means prophecy, it must flow from the DNA of Jesus Christ. It must flow from the DNA of Jesus Christ in its veins. It means prophecy. If we can say prophecy was a human being, prophecy in its veins, it flows the DNA of Jesus Christ so that it reveals Christ's resemblance. It reveals Christ's testimony. It witnesses to Christ. It exalts Christ. Hallelujah. It reveals his character. It reveals his conduct, his wisdom, his love, prophecy. It exalts Christ. Why? Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And tomorrow, that is exactly what I will be touching and speaking on. The spirit of prophecy. Because that is something that is very important. Because First Peter chapter 1 verse 11 it tells us that the spirit of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, is the spirit of what? Of, of prophecy. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Because the prophets, they were longing and searching for these days where the Holy Spirit will indwell God living in a human vessel. These latter days of glory, they prophesied. They spoke about the Messiah. They spoke about the Holy Spirit. Joel speaking about the infilling of the Spirit. They were longing for these days but why did they prophesy why how did they speak about the messiah how did they speak about the future the bible declares the spirit of christ was upon them okay let me read this verse then after that i am out of your way i will see you tomorrow tomorrow same place same time the bible declares Verse 10, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that will come to you? This is Peter speaking. Who prophesied of the grace that will come to you? Searching for what? Or what manner of time? The Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. Are you with me? The spirit of Christ, who was in Isaiah, who was in Zechariah, who was in Ezekiel, who was in Haggai, who was in Malachi, who was in Nahum, who was in Zephaniah, 
who was in Habakkuk, who was to Amos in, in Amos, who was in Daniel, who was in Jeremiah. The spirit of Christ was in them. That's why they could speak about Christ. They could speak about the Messiah because the spirit of Christ was with them, brought that prophetic message to them and made them to speak the message. It was the spirit of Christ pointing to the Messiah in the future. Are you with me here? The spirit of Christ speaking about the sufferings of Jesus that will take place in the future. So in other words, they did not just prophesy out of the vacuum. It was the spirit of Christ testifying about Jesus, the Son of God. That's why when Peter speaks in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, that they, no, no, they, they spoke, they prophesied as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And this is something that is very important as we look in the life of Zechariah, as we look in the life of a hard guy who were there to build up, not to tear down, who were there because prophecy, it exalts Christ. Prophecy, it exalts righteousness. Prophecy, it exalts purity. Prophecy, it correlates with the word of the Lord. Prophecy, it reinforces the word of the Lord. Prophecy, it leads people to God. Prophecy, it makes people to lead, to leave their immorality and wickedness and, 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 and wicked ways and they turn and run to God. That is true prophecy, the spirit of prophecy that makes men to be edified, to be nourished, to have a test for God's presence, fast and longing to pursue holiness. That is the true spirit of prophecy. Hallelujah. It does not exalt the spirit of Antichrist, but it brings people to Christ. Hallelujah. It brings hope. In as much as it brings hope, it also warns people. It warns them. It warns them about the upcoming judgment. That's what the prophets of God would do and would dwell and speak about that tomorrow. Zechariah speaking and Haggai to that generation that were rebuilding the temple of the Lord. Revival. It is all about rebuilding. Hallelujah. Revival. It is all about resuscitating and restoring something that was there. And we know that when our God restores, he doesn't just restore, but he restores with multiplication. We are in the latter days. And for us to see the latter glory, the unusual favor, the unusual favor, power and compassion to reach the lost, the end time revival, harvest to come into the house of the Lord. But before the Lord does that, he makes it a point that there are voices that are legitimate, that he has anointed, that he has called, that he has mandated, that he has authorized to run with the prophetic voice, prophetic message to the nation to be restored back to God. Like during this time of Zerubbabel and Ezra, hallelujah, and Joshua, who were, Joshua rather, the priest who flourished in rebuilding under the prophetic word. Let us look deeper tomorrow and speak about this spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you. We give you the glory and the honor. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for edifying us. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. If you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus was bruised, he was wounded. He died in my place and your place. He foreknew no sin, but he was made to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And today you can be the child of God, the righteousness of God, the co-worker, the able eye of the Lord in Christ. Your sins can be forgiven. By only believing with your heart, you confess with your mouth that indeed God raised Christ from the dead, who emerged victorious over the power of death and the grave, so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we can become children of God, most of all, that we may receive the precious gift 
of eternal life. It's by grace, through faith in Christ, that we are saved. If you want to accept Jesus today, and you want to become his child, just pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for the precious gift of eternal life. I am the child of God. I am no longer a sinner. If you've just made that prayer, please text us on WhatsApp and write on our timeline or on our uh, email. You would like to interact and uh, you, so that we walk together this spiritual journey, you know, and uh, serving the Lord together and not just serving the Lord together so that we can empower you with the resources that will strengthen you in your walk with your heavenly father church let us meet tomorrow at 6 p.m and uh, i will be starting from where i left off because i want to speak about the spirit of prophecy so that we understand that prophecy it the nature of prophecy it has to exalt christ it has to be christ centered it has to lead people to god it has to build god's church it does not scatter families. It does not exalt witchcraft. It does not exalt divination. It exalts Christ. It leads people to Christ. Hallelujah. Because it is the testimony of Jesus. God bless you. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us here at Faith and Cut Church. We are anchored in Christ, in his word, in his faith. God bless you.